the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. I wish you all a happy Lent, but I'm probably the only lunatic that gets jazzed about Lent. So I wish you a blessed Lent. How about that? Yesterday was Ash Wednesday, of course. If you're not Catholic, you're missing out, guys. Top short, long bottom, arete. How's it going, buddy? It looks like it's just you and me here today. We're a couple minutes late starting. Whether fortunately or unfortunately, I do still have a, an actual job to do. So, so my apologize for being uh, a few minutes late. What we're going to do today is go through uh, the news. Um, if you go to Emperor Invictus, oh, that's right, I'm supposed to plug things while we're waiting for everybody. If you go to Emperor Invictus on Twitter, that's where you will see all of this news. All these stories are already posted throughout the week, but we're going to talk about it here. While we're waiting, that's where you can go to uh, put in your email address so you can get the newsletter. Uh, if you scroll down to the bottom of the page, there is a thing for MailChimp so you can sign up. And then we've got this one. That is for the merchandise. I've done the plugs, so let's move on. First thing to note <clears throat> is some apparent collaboration behind the scenes between Google and X. So there are multiple people. Some find them credible. Some find them not credible, uh, who believed that this whole thing about Elon Musk taking over Twitter and going right wing and being the voice of sanity is actually all an act. And it's to get us all to get on board with these, this transhumanist program, right? Because otherwise the right wing would be up in arms about putting neurochips into people's brains and, uh, you know, blanketing the world in Starlink so that now war will be dependent upon a private actor. Usually we'd be protesting that. Instead, we're cheering Elon Musk on, yeah, you do whatever you want, buddy. We love it. We love technology now because you don't like wokeism. There are some people who think that. I'm not saying that's our position. But I am saying that X took away my blue check mark <laughs> after I had paid a year up front. So this whole free speech thing, oh, without notice, by the way, no notice whatsoever, no reasoning given whatsoever, um, an amazing anomaly, complain about it, of course he doesn't get back to me when I tweeted him. What's really strange and suspicious is that the very next day, my Google business profile for the law firm, not, not me personally, but the law firm's Google business page, was suspended for suspicious activity. So how these things happen at X and Google within 24 hours of one another, I mean, you might forgive a conspiracy theorist for thinking perhaps there's something going on behind the scenes. Because <clears throat> I've had X since, what, 2015? Uh, law firm's Google page has been there for, for months, many months. Um... Zero problems. I mean, there's always the shadow ban on X situation. We thought it was over when Musk came on board, and then it came back. The shadow ban is one thing, but taking away check marks with no notice and no justification, or Google business suspending law firm profiles for suspicious activity, that's incredible. And for it to happen again within 24 hours of one another, that's something to remark upon. We've got, let's see, Charlottesville. <clears throat> let's talk about Charlottesville. And also, I promised that I would look into the Aloha spirit and its conflict with the Supreme Court ruling. I did that. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the word master being removed from jurisprudence, from the legal profession, because it has negative connotations to slavery. We're going to talk about Fannie Willis. Willis, I was going to call this episode Prosecutors Gone Wild because we're going to talk about Fannie Willis and the Charlottesville prosecution, but, man, there are so many 
out of control prosecutors in this country right now that I feel like we should do a special episode just on that. Like we could talk about, <clears throat> you know, the J6 case, the Charlottesville case, the Fannie Willis disaster going on right now, the Ram case, the, uh, you know, everything. Um, what's his name? Rittenhouse. Um, so many prosecutors just completely out of control right now. So I don't think we're going to title it that. We call it Corrupt at Every Level because today we're talking about Google and X, you know, private actors, allegedly not governmental, <laughs> um, state level with Fannie Willis, federal level with the Ohio situation we're going to talk about, um, federal and state with the spirit of aloha, the Hawaiian Supreme Court battling it with the U.S. Supreme Court calling their ruling illegitimate, essentially. So you have federal and state and local. You've got private actors, government actors. You've got the courts and the executive branch. So at every level of American life, you are seeing this total corruption going on. Hence the title. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Last aside before we get into the news. I didn't watch the Super Bowl. I'm sure you didn't either, but I'm sure you heard about the ads. Um, they posted this uh, ad about he gets us. He gets us. With all these Christians washing the feet of Muslims, of homosexuals, of just assorted persons who are not favored by Christian theology. So there's been a backlash, of course, with memes of Jesus with a whip driving people out of the temple saying, he gets us. <laughs> um, one pastor remarked, yeah, uh, Jesus did wash Judas's feet and then he still sent him to hell. So that's going on just in time for Lent. First thing we're going to talk about today, let's see on the little, on the news thread here. <clears throat> the Her Report, H-U-R, like Ben Her, right? So Her wrote this report. He investigated Biden for this whole gaffe about bringing home classified documents because you might have heard they uh, pressed charges against Trump for that while Biden did the same thing and nobody cared. So they investigated it. Numerous things came out in this report, top of which you've probably heard is that Biden is a essentially senile. A uh, senile old man who, with a bad memory um, looks really bad. Now you've got <clears throat> attorneys general at the state level uh, arguing that Kamala Harris should be invoking the 25th Amendment and removing Biden from office. So that's a new circus that I've never seen. <laughs> uh, but what is really important, I think, is this quote here. In recent weeks, President Biden has grumbled to aides and advisors that had Garland moved sooner, that is Attorney General Merrick Garland, had Garland moved sooner in his investigation into former President Donald Trump's election interference, a trial may already be underway or even have concluded, according to two people granted anonymity to discuss private matters. That trial still could take place before the election, and much of the delay is owed not to Garland, but to deliberate resistance put up by the former president and his team. Incredible. So that's Politico, the obviously leftist, uh, quote-unquote neutral uh, political rag, talking about the Her Report. <clears throat> Even Politico is pointing out, Grum uh, Biden is complaining that Merrick Garland didn't investigate Trump and bring him to trial fast enough. Not third world country stuff at all. Biden is not at all pulling the levers. He's not at all influencing this process of prosecuting the, his lead rival in the presidential election. And now, there's a, an independent report on it. Just balls out. Our president is trying to stop his rival from taking power. He's trying to stop him by putting him in prison. It has come to America now. Very unlikely he's actually going to pull it off. Um, 
It's so outrageous, and they did such a bad job of it. Um, and Trump is so popular. And he has great lawyers. And the prosecution theories are just so nonsensical. And the evidence so stacked in favor of Trump that it's highly unlikely he's ever going to go to jail. All Biden and company have done is give him political credibility and make Trump a martyr. Biggest backlash of the century. But it has opened the door to future prosecutions. And what they might not have thought about is that once Trump gets in office, now that this precedent has been set, what's going to stop Trump from prosecuting all of these prosecutors who are just bold face corrupt or from prosecuting Biden. Maybe he doesn't care about the her report. Maybe he says, well, he admitted it. He admitted to storing these files or Ukraine. What's going to stop Trump from prosecuting Biden and putting him in prison for the rest of his life? You know, now that this door has been opened, nothing but Trump's Largess. We'll see what he does because it seems a foregone conclusion he's going to win. We got Canadians saying that uh, there's no such thing as parental rights in Canada. That's what's coming here. Let's go into Hawaii since we promised we would talk about that. That's what the last episode was about. Um, 737 says the script has Trump win. Yeah, I mean, the media is already calling it for Trump. CNN is talking about, well, legal experts say these are the horrible things Trump is going to do when he gets back in office. Um, it's bad. It's bad, <laughs> bad for them, that is. Um, good for America, I dare say. Because who else is, is it going to be Biden? Biden's going to run again? Bi Biden might not make it to the election. He's so out of it. And like I said, they're already telling Kamala Harris, you need to invoke the 25th Amendment and take over. And then what if she runs? Who's going to be her running mate? Are they really going to put Gavin Newsom as vice president? That would be crazy. So I'm sure some very smart super donors to the Democratic Party have already got a game plan here. <clears throat> We're about to watch it roll out. Over the next, uh, what, nine months, we're going to watch it roll out. We're going to watch some riots happen. We're going to watch some terrorism happen. Maybe a plague. Anything to stop Trump from getting into office. It's going to be a wild year, everybody. So this is an article from Reuters. Again, if you go to Emperor Invictus at Twitter, uh, you'll see all of this news has been posted throughout the week. This is what we're going to talk about. Hawaii top court upholds gun laws, criticizes U.S. Supreme Court. What a fascinating thing to do. Summary by Reuters. Hawaii Supreme Court says it disagrees with U.S. Supreme Court's Second Amendment rulings. Incredible. Court upholds laws barring carrying guns in public without a license. <laughs> so the Hawaii Supreme Court is saying... Yeah, we know what you said at the U.S. Supreme Court, but you're wrong. And our state law trumps what you're saying at the U.S. Supreme Court. The Hawaii Supreme Court has upheld the state's laws that generally prohibit carrying a firearm in public without a license, and in the process criticized the conservative majority U.S. Supreme Court's rulings that have expanded gun rights. Justice Todd Eddins wrote in a unanimous, unanimous 5-0 to zero decision on Wednesday. That, uh, that's last Wednesday. Uh, that under the U.S. Constitution's Second Amendment, quote, states retain the authority to require individuals have a license before carrying firearms in public, end quote. The court, comprised of three appointees of Democratic governors and two Republican-appointed judges, said it disagreed with the U.S. Supreme Court's recent rulings, interpreting the right to keep and bear arms under the Second Amendment. Just stop right there. Can you imagine a state having the power to do that? 
I mean, what if this? What if the state of Florida said, "Yeah, yeah, I hear what you're saying about gay marriage, but screw that." In Florida, uh, we don't we don't go by that law, dog. No gays are getting married down here in Florida. I don't care how constitutional you think it is up there at the U.S. Supreme Court. There would be <laughs> there would be a civil war over homosexual marriage. What if for the past what fifty years? You know, said eighty three hundred. What if for the past 50 years, we've got this abortion regime under Roe v. Wade and the state of, I don't know, uh, Wyoming said, yeah, we see what you're saying over there, the U.S. Supreme Court about, uh, you know, there being a right to abortion, but uh, we ain't having that around here in Wyoming. Uh, here in Wyoming, fetuses are people and they've got rights. And we disagree with your interpretation of the U.S. Constitution over there at the U.S. Supreme Court. I mean, we might agree with that, and we might agree with Florida saying no gay marriage, but you can see, obviously, how that would create pure pandemonium. What if, I think it's USV, it was Twombly, right? The Twombly decision was a big CivPro thing, like a uh, civil procedure about rules of pleadings and federal court. <laughs> you know, what if the state of Alabama said, yeah, we don't like Twombly down here. You can take Twombly, you can shove it. And then Alabama, as opposed to the other 49 states in the Union, uh, has different federal court pleading procedures. And what if every state had the ability to interpret the law and say the U.S. Supreme Court's interpretation of the law is actually wrong? U.S. Supreme Court's interpretation of the Constitution is actually incorrect. Uh, and we're going to uphold the state law that the U.S. Supreme Court would say is unconstitutional. You can see how that would be pure chaos, even though it would work in our favor, you know, 50% of the time. You can't have that. That's the whole point of the supreme law of the land and, you know, all those old Supreme Court cases from when America first started saying that uh, there's precedence here and preemptive power of Congress, all that stuff. Like, this is settled. At least it was until Hawaii came out swinging. God bless them. Uh, Padfa saying Russian nukes in space, latest security scare. Who saw that coming? Man, I think everybody saw that coming in like the 80s. Like, it was only a matter of time. Um, I wonder when we get to carry nukes in public without a license. That's really what the Constitution requires. The libertarians will point that out. And of course, they're crazy. But when you think about it, the Second Amendment is about fighting the government with weapons uh, when the government gets too tyrannical and the government has upgraded from muskets to you know rifles and bombs and tanks and nukes and well doesn't the second amendment then say that citizens should have all those things to fight tyranny it's a libertarian argument I'm not making that argument I'm just giving legal commentary we have no political positions on this show this is Purely a legal podcast for the Invictus Law Firm, a criminal defense law firm in Orlando, Florida. The website for which is AugustusInvictus.com. And that's me, yours truly, the host of this program. And I think I plugged the uh, email list earlier and the viral style where you can buy our delicious merchandise. So please scroll up and find that if you're on YouTube. If you're on Twitter, stop watching the video on Twitter. Go to YouTube. Um, we're going to figure all that out eventually. I'm just pretty upset about them taking my blue check mark away. No notice, no justification. Just took it away and shadow banned. What are you going to do? Nothing. Because Twitter has more money than God. So... To continue with the article, it expressed that disagreement, that is the disagreement with the U.S. Supreme Court's ruling interpreting the right to keep and bear arms under the Second Amendment. Hawaii, their Supreme Court, expressed that disagreement as it interpreted a near-identical provision of the state's constitution, which says, A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state 
the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So, Eddins, the judge in Hawaii, wrote, quote, We read those words differently than the current United States Supreme Court. What a fascinating thing to say. Than the current United States Supreme Court. So, if 20 years from now, the Supreme Court's makeup changes and becomes liberal again, well, then you might interpret them in the same way as that current United States Supreme Court. I think it's clear the jig is up. Right? Nobody's, uh, now that the conservatives are in control of the Supreme Court, uh, nobody's playing the game of, well, this is an august body of members who are above politics, um, you know, the greatest legal minds in our country, and they're not beholden to the mob or the political weather vane. That's out the window. And the liberals threw it out. Well, it's a conservative control now. So now it's the current United States Supreme Court that we disagree with, not the United States Supreme Court before that. Between, let's say, 1950 with uh, the Board of Education v. Brown, all the way up to, mm, I don't know, three years ago. Like, we'll agree with that Supreme Court. Everything before 1950, going back to the founding of America, well, that's all racist. White supremacist, patriarchal, hate-mongering. All of those opinions should be burned. But 1950 to about three years ago, that, that's fine. We love those opinions. That's the real U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, Now that these white supremacist, patriarchal hate mongers have taken over the Supreme Court again, forget that. Let's go back to that golden age of 1950 to 2020. Amazing that it's just in black and white. Balls out. That's where we are. United States Supreme Court is now illegitimate, according to liberals. We got to stack that Supreme Court. We got to impeach the Supreme Court justices. They've been after Justice Thomas for a long time now, going after his wife. Dirty, man. Dirty stuff going on. And now it's just, uh, yeah, well, they've entered the political fray. United States Supreme Court is not doing what the liberals want anymore. We got to take them out. Got to take them out, put in some liberal Supreme Court justices. My God, what are they going to do when Trump wins and there's a conservative Supreme Court? I can't even, I can't imagine. I mean, they can't let that happen, right? So Eddins, that is the Hawaii judge, he said the right was instead militia-centric, as courts had long understood the Second Amendment before the U.S. Supreme Court, starting in 2008, recognized an individual right to bear arms for self-defense in its District v. Columbia, uh, excuse me, District of Columbia v. Heller ruling. I remember 2008. I don't know if you remember, but that was how many years ago? You know, and now he's, uh, that can't be 16 years. That's, my math must be off. Because that's a long time. There's no way I was in law school that long ago. (laughs) So, my God, my sons are 18 years old. Wow. Anyway, boomer moment. Point being, 2008 was a long time ago. This Hawaii judge is saying, I'm wrong. I was wrong. It's not 1950 to 2020. It's actually 1950 to 2008. That 58-year period, that's the golden age of the U.S. Supreme Court. But once they came out with District of Columbia v. Heller, saying there's an individual right to bear arms recognized under the Second Amendment, that's where Eddins says, no way, Jose, that is not what the Founding Fathers meant. Now, liberals love what the Founding Fathers meant. They, they want to talk about that now. <laughs> when you bring up originalism in any other context, they don't want to talk about that. Well, the Constitution's a living document, and uh, they couldn't have possibly foreseen blah, 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 the woman's right to murder her child, like the need to murder children in the womb. Founding fathers couldn't possibly predict that. You gotta let the Constitution grow, man. Get with the times. Founding fathers couldn't possibly have known that college kids would need to smoke weed all over the country. Come on, man. 
We've got a constitutional right to smoke weed. Constitutional right to murder our children in the womb. No, but now, now the liberal justice wants to say, well, the founding fathers uh, thought it should be militia, <laughs> militia-centric. That's how it was understood before 2008. <laughs> Amazing. This, the, the, the mental acrobatics and gymnastics these people go through. Quote, those words do not support a right to possess lethal weapons in public for possible self-defense, end quote, he wrote. Which is an amazing statement, too, because what is the Second Amendment for? It's not for hunting. It's not for putting your musket up on the wall next to the deer head you took as a trophy. The Second Amendment is explicitly for fighting against the government. That is a plain fact. The court reached that conclusion, that is the Hawaii court, as it reversed a lower court's judge's, uh, excuse me, a lower court judge's decision dismissing two charges filed against Christopher Wilson after he was arrested for trespassing on someone's property with an unregistered pistol. Hawaii Attorney General Ann Lopez, a Democrat, hailed the ruling as a landmark decision that affirms the constitutionality of crucial gun safety legislation. Hold the phone. We're going to talk about an article I completely forgot about. This is, uh, I didn't post this on my own. Uh, this is in one of my private, uh, you know, group chats here. Somebody sent to us. Uh, of course it's not loading now. Of all the times. Of all the times. Just, let's put a pin in that, right? Hawaii Attorney General Lopez, a Democrat, hailed the ruling as a landmark decision that affirms the constitutionality of crucial gun safety legislation. What an amazing thing. We're going to come back to that. Oh, here we go. Nope, I got it. Brady. Right? Here we go. Brady. United against gun violence. You can go to Brady Buzz on Twitter. Their tagline is, We are uniting Americans from coast to coast, red and blue and every color, to end gun violence. Right? As a nonprofit in Washington, D.C. Their post from yesterday, <laughs> it reads as follows. I thought this was a parody or some out-of-control, lunatic, racist, writing this. No, this is Brady, United Against Gun Violence. Our new study finds that despite making up just 14% of the U.S. population, black Americans account for 60% of firearm homicides each year. Honoring black history means ending gun violence. Learn more about the facts that make us act. Wow. You open that link to the article. It says black Americans account for 60% of firearm homicides each year, report finds. Uh, subheading, the Brady Center to Prevent Gun Violence analyzed firearm mortality data from the CDC. Wow. So let's go back so you can find this so you don't think I'm lying. At Brady Buzz. That's B-R-A-D-Y B-U-Z-Z. You can look it up yourself. This is real. Uh, somebody's getting fired for publishing this article, I'll tell you that. Because white supremacists are going to be out of control quoting this. The Brady Center to Prevent Gun Violence analyzed firearm mortality data from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention between 2017 and 2021. Researchers found that the average firearm mortality homicide rate for black people of all ages was 21.05 per 100,000 people, compared with 1.93 per 100,000 for non-Hispanic white people. The largest disparity was in the 18 to 24 age group, where, excuse me, where black people had a firearm mortality rate of 58.78 per 100,000 people, compared with 3.1, 3.1 per 100,000 people for white people. 60% versus 3%. That is a massive disparity. And some fool 
at the Brady Center to Prevent Gun Violence pointed it out. I mean, this was published three days ago. I'm amazed it's still up. But somebody's definitely getting fired for this. Can't say that. Can't say that without getting canceled. So, the Hawaii Attorney General Ann Lopez, a Democrat, hailed the ruling as a landmark decision that affirms the constitutionality of crucial gun safety legislation. What if this is just a legal hypothetical? I'm obviously not promoting this. We take no political position here at Crime and Punishment. This is a show for legal analysis only. So let me pose a legal hypothetical. Would Ann Lopez agree, the Attorney General of Hawaii, that crucial gun safety legislation should be passed to disarm black males from 18 to 24? Would that not be common sense? If 60% of the gun violence in America is by black men, wouldn't it be crucial gun safety legislation to disarm black men? Would Hawaii agree with that? Would the aloha spirit trump the United States Supreme Court's decisions from Heller to the present day? Because this is an out-of-control statistic that cannot be countenanced and cannot be hidden from. I don't know. Just a hypothetical. How would the Democrat and Lopez feel about that? But I'm sure it's all white supremacy. That's really what's to blame here. I'm sure we'll get there. Don't worry. Attorney General Lopez will let us know why this is white people's fault. A lawyer for Wilson, Benjamin Lowenthal, said he and his colleagues were reviewing the ruling and taking stock of our options. So you might remember Wilson is the one who was allegedly trespassing while armed with an unregistered weapon. His charges were dismissed because the U.S. Supreme Court said, no, you can't pass laws like that. And then the Hawaii Supreme Court said, nope, reinstate those charges because the United States Supreme Court is wrong. So his lawyer, Lowenthal, is saying they're taking stock of their options. At the trial court level, a judge had concluded the charges against Wilson violated his right to keep and bear arms under the Second Amendment in light of the U.S. Supreme Court's landmark 2022 ruling in New York State Rifle and Pistol Association v. Bruin. In that case, the court's 6-3 conservative majority recognized for the first time that Second Amendment protects an individual's right to carry a handgun in public for self-defense. It also established a new test for assessing firearms laws, saying restrictions must be consistent with this nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation. While that test has led to several rulings invalidating gun regulations nationally, Eddins and Wednesday's decision said Bruin did not bar states from imposing gun licensing requirements. He also criticized Bruin, as he interpreted the state interpretation in a different way than the U.S. Supreme Court has with the federal one. Quote, Time traveling to 1791 or 1868 to call her how a state regulates lethal weapons per the Constitution's democratic design is a dangerous way to look at the federal Constitution, end quote. And then he says, the Constitution is not a suicide pact. That's an old phrase. Eddins didn't make that up. He's quoting another uh, long dead Supreme Court justice. I don't remember which case it is, but it's a pretty famous line. So he's saying now... Well, we can't go back to 1791 or 1868 to figure out how these guys would have interpreted this. I mean, that's ridiculous. Look at the weapons now. Isn't this the same guy that just said the founding fathers interpreted this as militia-centric? So out of one side of his mouth, he's saying the founding fathers wouldn't have agreed with this. The Second Amendment is obviously militia-centered. It always has been. And on the other side of his mouth, he's saying... Yeah, that's dangerous. You can't go back, take a time machine and go back there uh, and see, you know, how they would have interpreted these things about, uh, you know, dangerous weapons. You can't have it both ways. Now, of course, the counter to that would be, well, you conservatives are talking out of both sides of your mouth. You're saying, on the one hand, we can go back in a time machine and look how these guys would have said this and so on and so forth. But on the other side, you're saying, well... 
This whole thing about militia centered is not actually how the Founding Fathers believed, or if it was, we don't care. That's changed. But I think it's clear that that's not at all the case. Maybe it was militia centered, but it was obviously for self-defense. And the test here, as they amazingly Reuters actually quoted, um, says that these restrictions must be, quote, consistent with this nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation, end quote. Well, this nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation recognizes the fact that weapons are for self-defense. Has been ever since the time of the militias. Has been ever since the founding of this country. So these liberals are trying to talk out of both sides of their mouth. Well, we can't interpret it the way they would have, but at the same time, well, they, they would have interpreted it as militia-centric. They're, they're lying out of both sides of their mouth. These are not real arguments. These are just plain lies. And one day, their lying mouths will be stopped. By the U.S. Supreme Court, of course. In the court of law. After oral arguments and briefing, I'm sure. But this will end. Let's go to the chat here. The red flag laws. Yes, I was talking about this with somebody. Um, oh, it was the paramilitary training thing we were talking about last week, right? The Preventing Private Paramilitary Activity Act of 2024. We had a whole episode on that. If you missed it, go back and watch episode 86. Because at the end, they put in these tags, right? Number one, the Attorney General can file in civil court to get an injunction against you if he believes that you are going to train people or that you are going to attend an event or that you're going to train to go to an event. Like, he can file for an injunction to stop you from committing a crime. That's crazy. But then what gets crazier is they allow a right of private action. So your neighbor, Sally, can go to the, to the civil court, the district court, federal court in your neighborhood uh, and file a lawsuit against you for an injunction and for damages. That's nuts. And they can try to take your assets by, through civil asset forfeiture. Um, so I was talking with somebody, uh, another lawyer, about this. And they brought up, well, what about these red flag laws? And I'm like, well, yeah. That's how it is. Um, this is like the next evolution in that. So you have the right to have firearms. But if your neighbor says, you know, I think John is having a mental health crisis... He's got guns. I'm going to call the police. And they call the police and they tell them, my neighbor John, he's drunk. He's on one. He's having a mental health crisis. I know he's got guns. I just don't feel comfortable about that in my neighborhood. Police go out there. They get the uh, judge to sign off on it. They take your guns because of your mental health crisis. Might hospitalize. You might not. You might... Uh, be smart enough to get a hearing and get your guns back. You might actually be having a mental health crisis. I don't know. That does happen. But they've found a way to short-circuit the Constitution to get around that little Second Amendment and say, well, he's crazy. <laughs> Take his guns. they figured that out. So now they've figured out a way. You don't even have to break the law, man. The Attorney General just has to think, yeah, I have reason to believe they're going to break the law. They are going to travel across state lines and attend this rally and act in, a, uh, in the manner of law enforcement when they are not a uh, state-authorized militia. And I'm going to file in federal court and I'm going to get an injunction and stop them from traveling. What's the difference? What's the difference between that and the red flag laws? They're preventing violence based on a reasonable estimation of you're nuts and you're going to break the law. Second Amendment, Schmeckin Amendment. Seamus, good to see you here live, buddy. Been a long time. 737 says, in my years, they switch up every four years and nothing changes. Both parties are the same. No difference at all. Yep. Yep. Once you've been around a few election cycles, you know it. Florida Treasure. Hello from Orlando. Back at you from Orlando. So, we got, uh, man, we are late today. We only got like 15 minutes. 
It's the most important thing. Well, like I said, we were going to name this uh, Prosecutors Gone Wild, so let's talk about that. Let's talk about Charlottesville. That's why everybody's here, right? In Charlottesville last month, in the case of Jacob Dix, his attorney, Peter Frazier, won a motion to disqualify the prosecutor's office (laughs) based on the fact that the prosecutor is Antifa and was acting as a lawyer or at least an agent for Black Lives Matter and was openly uh, giddy about the fact that the Unite the Right uh, rally was going to be canceled and the permit pulled. Obviously, he has an axe to grind. He is following around, quote-unquote, white supremacists, calling the cops on them, uh, uh, just like the red flag laws and the Attorney General under the Paramilitary Activity Act, uh, because he wanted to prevent violence, right? I mean, just miles of documentation showing this prosecutor is Antifa. He is working with Black Lives Matter. He is working with Antifa. They took over the prosecutor's office in order to go after their political enemies. So he won. Prosecutor's office was disqualified. However, they then filed a motion to reconsider. And went full law professor trying to bully the judge. Well, there's no blah, 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 and you actual prejudice and this legal standard and that. and Nonsense. It's a bunch of gobbledygook written by a law professor trying to wow people with legal terms and legalese. They went back on that this Monday, a mere four days ago, on the 12th. Then the judge said, nope, (laughs) sorry, Uh, you're still disqualified. I'm appointing a special prosecutor. So that has happened. Now, under Virginia law, there's no such thing as collateral estoppel in these cases. So the fact that one judge disqualifies the prosecutor's office, even on identical facts, um, doesn't mean that it applies to all of the defendant's cases. So I have a hearing on Tuesday for this same exact thing. Will the prosecutor's office be disqualified? Same facts, same corrupt prosecutors, same Antifa prosecutor who was there the night of the events that he is prosecuting. (laughs) The same prosecutor who was working with the chief judge's wife and daughter and everybody else in town. The same prosecutor who took over the prosecutor's office to prosecute his political enemies, drag them across state lines and jail them without bond. We got to go find out, well, does that disqualify them from the case? So that's the news there. What was the other one? Oh, Fannie Willis. Yes, prosecutors. Prosecutors in this country, man. Um, I don't know if I even have the article on here, but I feel like I mentioned this last week. So Fannie Willis is the prosecutor uh, down in Georgia. So Trump is on trial down there for trying to overturn the 2020 election, right? So she appoints a black man to prosecute this case. There's questions whether she even had the authority to do that, but just whatever, just go with it. (laughs) Let's say she did. She appoints this black man with whom she is having a sexual affair. He is now being paid with public money and they are jet-setting all over the place, going on luxury trips together. I don't know. I guess it's not amazing. I mean, is anybody really surprised anymore? Oh, you know what? Fannie Willis is trending on Twitter. Let's go see if there's an article there. This should be good. Because then they tried to quash the subpoenas and said, oh, this shouldn't be, (laughs) this shouldn't be investigated at all. This is Trump, uh, you know, derailing the the court system and making the courts look illegitimate. Like you haven't done that yourself. 
Democrats prosecuting a former president. He's been indicted four times, four different places, last I checked, by politically motivated prosecutors. But no, Trump pointing out the corruption of the prosecutors. No, that's what chat, what uh, creates the, the distrust in the judicial process, right? Not your corruption, of course. Oh my God, I can't believe I'm about to read Laura Loomer. Uh, but you got to give credit where credit's due. This is Laura Loomer's tweet. It's first thing up. I can't help it. Just in. You can imagine this in her voice if you want. Nathan Wade was just made to admit in court that he lied on his interrogatories for his divorce from his wife. He just said he did not he did have sexual relations with Fannie Willis before May 30th, 2023. When he filed the interrogatory, he said no. Today he said yes. That is perjury. Well, you caught him, Laura. Good for you. Good for you. Charlie Kirk, next usual suspect. Fannie Willis thinks that questioning her about her secret affair with Nathan Wade that included paying him $600,000 of taxpayer money is anti-democracy. Quote, I'm not a hostile witness. I very much want to be here. Miss Merchant's interests are contrary to democracy, Your Honor, not to mine. End quote. This is the same woman who, after this came out, and it wasn't even Trump's lawyers. It was one of his co-defendants' lawyers. This came out from their pleadings, and she, the balls on this woman. She went to this meeting uh, this, where she was giving a speech, and she said, can you believe these people? Can a black man of such a caliber not prosecute without people coming after him? Like, trying to completely pull the race card and saying, this is about him being a black man prosecuting a white man. Has nothing to do about the allegations that you know, he's being paid 600 grand to do this and I'm flying around having sex with him everywhere. Amazing. That's the state of America today, buddy. This is usually a family program. There's only so much you can clean up. Something like that. No Name asks, what scope does this decision to revisit any of the Charlottesville prosecutions? Uh, what scope does this decision give to revisit any of the Charlottesville prosecutions? That's an excellent question. Excellent question. Like I said, there's no collateral estoppel in Virginia. So technically, none of these rulings apply to the other co-defendants. However... Uh, you know, I know in one case, a defense lawyer st said on record, I don't want my client to take this plea. He's innocent, but he's got a family. He wants to take the plea to go home. Nothing I can do about that. That defense lawyer, in my mind, is blameless. Sometimes your clients just, they don't want to fight. Nothing, it's their decision. It's not the lawyer's decision to go to trial. The, if the client wants to take the plea and go home to his family, 100% understand and... That's the way the case is going to go. That lawyer didn't want it to go that way, but had to do it. However, any lawyer who threw their client under the bus at Charlottesville, yeah, they should have a bar complaint. Those convictions should be overturned. Here in Florida, we have a motion for post-conviction relief based on ineffective assistance of counsel. I don't know if there's an analog in Virginia, but... To my mind, those co-defendants who took pleas in this case, they should be looking into that. And that's not legal advice. I'm not a lawyer in Virginia, but I am a defendant in Virginia. And this case is so outrageous that it just seems common sense that now that it has been proved that the chief judge and his family were involved in this, now that it has been proved that the prosecutors were Antifa, were there the night in question, and that this entire prosecution was corrupt from day one, I think those defendants who took pleas in Virginia have a strong case to overturn their convictions. Okay, not legal advice. Just my position as a defendant who happens to be a lawyer. LP says, what's up, Augustus? I remember reading somewhere you were in the Illinois bar. Any interesting stories regarding the Illinois state legal system? Yes, of course. <laughs> I, you are right. Uh, I am in the Illinois bar, and I do have interesting stories. However, 
It is 1557. We're late signing off. I do have work to do. So remind me next week when we start the program, and I will tell you all about the horrific case of Matt Hale. What a tragedy to befall that man. Um, that's the worst case uh, imaginable. You know, oh, wasn't, uh, no, Milligan was Indiana. I'm sorry. But I'll tell you that story too. I got so many stories about the law. I mean, we'll talk about it next week, buddy. No Name says collateral estoppel is not a principle that I know of in English car- criminal law. Very interesting getting the comparison. In England, one would seek to apply the criminal cases review committee. Uh, good point. Collateral estoppel is typically, you look at that as something civil. Uh, maybe in contract law, that's a good point. Um, however, you know, in a case where co-defendants are you know, facing the same issues with the same parties, you know, you would think that one case's decision is going to affect the other one. In Virginia, no, there's like a wall that's up there. But uh, again, I'm not a lawyer in Virginia. Disclaimer: Don't you dare try to report me to the Virginia bar. I'm not giving legal advice here. This show is for entertainment program, uh, entertainment purposes only. So, I don't know how I ended up here, but I hope to learn something from it, says Rune's Child. <clears throat> I'm sorry, man, but uh, you actually came in right at the tail end. We're on our way out. But uh, you can listen to this. You can listen to our previous episode, 86, on paramilitary training, that act that uh, they're trying to pass. Um, but we'll come back next week. I don't know. I mean, what are we going to talk about next week? I guess we'll find out. Um, I'm sure something horrible will happen this week. Till then, everybody.